thank everybody for showing up. This is the final event of this semester in our year-long forum on economic justice. Uh, this forum has been supported by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, and our local AFT union. Um, tonight's talk is by Dr. Michael Rubenstein. Um, I'm going to let him talk about the title. I will. It's changed, and he will discuss that. But Dr. Rubenstein is an assistant professor of English at SUNY Stony Brook, where he teaches a variety of classes on Anglophone and British literature, including Irish modernism, post-colonialism, film, and intersections between environmentalism and the humanities. In 2010, he published his first book, Public Works, Infrastructure, Irish Modernism, and the Post-Colonials, and the Post-Colonial, excuse me, um, with the University of Notre Dame Press. This book has been very well received. It received the, um, it was awarded the 2011 Modern Studies, Modern Studies Association Book Prize and the 2010 Rhodes Prize for Best Book in Irish Literature, awarded by the American Conference of Irish Studies. What makes this book so groundbreaking is not that it's about Irish modernism. There's a whole industry built around Irish modernism. What makes it groundbreaking is um, Professor Rubenstein takes figures like Joyce, like Flann O'Brien, and rethinks their text through infrastructure, through thinking about the technology of the state through gas, water, and electricity in particular, and how the literature of modernism participates in the construction of the state and the emerging post-colonial state of Ireland. Um, the book is also comparative. It ends with him thinking about these same issues in the global south through Patrick <coughs> Chamblessy's uh, Texaco, and his current work is picking up on that theme, thinking about infrastructure and character in the global south. His talk tonight, of an ambiguous name, which you will explain. Um, this talk tonight, Resource Wars, the character of development in recent post-colonial fiction, draws some on his uh, previous work in um, Public Works, his book, but also on his current research on the Global South. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to... All right. Thank you all for coming. You know, this is a... Uh, this late stage of the semester, I'm barely like rolling out of bed. I feel lucky if I can get that far, um, and so I really do appreciate you coming. And I know that I'm the last in the series, um, and that the series itself, <coughs> it's a series I'm delighted to, to be a speaker in uh, on the theme of economic justice, um, or exploring economic justice, but of course my talk is going to be much more literary, I think, than the rest of the talks that you've heard over the course of the semester. Um, before I get going, I do want to thank uh, Mindy uh, and John Sisko for inviting me uh, to uh, give a talk to you today. Um, so what I want to talk about, uh, like as, as Mindy said, which my first book was about the concept of infrastructure, and I want to talk about that some more today. But I want to talk about it mainly as a function of economic justice, particularly in parts of the uh, under or undeveloped world where some of the basic infrastructures that we in the U.S. take for granted access to potable water, sewage, electricity, things like that, but also including roads, schools, hospitals, etc., are a very serious and pressing issue because of their, their lack. Um, and I'm changing my title now. Originally, uh, it was called Resource Wars, and I changed it to Life Support. Initially, I thought that that would have a little bit more uplift to it <laughs> um, and sound less, less violent, but actually now I'm realizing that I went from a sort of blockbuster movie to a kind of... Uh, retirement home, <laughs> but I hope, I hope it'll still have some excitement uh, in, in any case. Um, uh, anyway, and the reasons for that title I think will become apparent in the, uh, by the end of the talk. So in order to talk about infrastructure and human rights and literature, or economic justice and literature, I'm going to uh, do a reading today of the no three novels by um, an author named Mohsen Hamid. He's a contemporary Pakistani writer who lives between Lahore, New York, and London, but whose three novels are all set in and around Lahore in uh, Pakistan. Has anybody, does anybody know Hamid's work? The Reluctant Fundamentalist, probably his most popular book from 2007. I'm going to do my best to uh, make the plots clear and interesting and engaging, and hopefully, you know, hopefully make you want to read uh, the books uh, by the time I'm done. Um, although we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, what I'm going to argue about Hamid's novels is that they reveal a sort of thematic obsession with infrastructure, in this case, particularly with the infrastructure of electricity and electricity grids, that ultimately tells us something about how citizens of the global south, or the third world, or however you want to uh, uh, name it, 
uh, how their development needs um, and what their development, how they conceptualize their own development needs and their rights to development, their, their economic and social rights to various forms of development, particularly infrastructure and electricity. So I'm going to take some time before I get to Hamid uh, to, uh, uh, and spend the first half of my talk today setting up why I'm doing this work, why I think it's important. So let me first of all define what I mean by infrastructure. For me, infrastructure is comprised sort of of all the public works projects that have a very uh, material, concrete basis, like bridges, roads, electrical grids, sewers. There's other kinds of infrastructure, but for the purposes of my talk and my work, I, st I stay restricted to these things. Um, anything that's really part of the built environment that's not corporate or private, right, that's uh, publicly funded and, and has a sort of public provenance that it's, it's for the use of everybody, I suppose. Um, so these, these concrete uh, things, these public works projects with a material basis that tend to be nearly totally invisible when they're functioning properly and totally dis disruptive to business as usual whenever they're not working properly. In fact, they become a sudden source of infinite frustration. All you have to do is think about you know, the announcement that your train is late or uh, sitting in traffic or any of these other experiences that we all have every day to understand exactly what I'm talking about um, uh, when I talk about that, that frustration. So infrastructure tends its purpose is usually to be pretty invisible, and it's only, it only comes to our attention under normal circumstances when it, when it doesn't work. Um, so I tend to think about infrastructure as a form of public works insofar as infrastructures tend to be massive and expensive. When Adam Smith, in, in his uh, Wealth of Nations um, from the early part of the uh, 19th century, defines public works in, in the Wealth of Nations, he does so by pointing out that they are structures that the state must undertake to build because they are so massive and so expensive that the profit, no, the profit motive would never be enough to call them into existence in the first place because no corporation could hope to make a profit from the fundamental building blocks of it, right? The, the electrical grid is like, the, like this in the United States um, and so, is, uh, so are uh, a number of other things that, are, that they're attempting to privatize, among other things, water um, and certain communications networks as well. Um, so Smith was thinking about roads mainly when he wrote that thing about public works being funded by the state because it was too expensive to be funded by, by private corporations. But it's definitely applicable to sewers and electricity grids and all these, these sort of modern versions of infrastructure that we would think of in our, own, uh, in our contemporary lives. Um, unlike in Smith, usually these things are funded in a sort of complex way, a partnership between public and private um, entities, but in any case, the basic definition, I think, still stands uh, heuristically for, for the purposes of, of my talk today. Um, so public works are, in their origin, public goods. That is, they're, they're made for the good of the public, right? And as such, they ought to be considered in the 20th century as a human right, right? Everybody has a right of access. At least, we could agree, has a right of access to uh, water, for example, potable water, um, as a starting point. Um, and of course, in two very recent examples of this are water infrastructure, in fact, right? Like in the bankrupt city of Detroit, for one, or in the sort of austerity constrained Republic of Ireland right now, where they're trying to impose uh, water taxes on everybody. Uh, and, and the argument, the counter argument, both in Detroit and in Ireland, is that all these people have uh, rights, right? They have, it's, their, their, right, their right to water is being defended through a discourse of human rights, of entitlements of a kind of commons, right, that everybody has access to. So that's um, uh, one sort of contemporary example. But again, I'm going to be talking about electricity um, once we get to uh, Hamid in a minute. So when I talk about infrastructure, I have a tendency to focus on electricity for a couple of reasons. One of them is because I'm trained as a scholar, as a, as a modernist, but I read mean modernist texts like Irish modernism, uh, 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 James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, was the Bowen, figures like that, from the early part of the 20th century. Um, and according to uh, one independent histori historian named uh, Wolfgang Schivelbusch, um, in the early 20th century, electricity and modernity were equated. Electric current was viewed as nothing less than the medium and energy source of modernity. Um, this is something that we often don't talk about, I think, enough in literature classes or in periodizing classes, that you know, at this period, right at the turn of the century, um, the electricity grid was being built for the very first time, and people were freaked out. It was a huge big deal. It, it colored kind of everything that they did, and a lot of the cultural artifacts that come out of that period. Um, so I think we underestimate the impact of electrification in the early part of the 20th century. Um, 
to measure that impact, here's a historical sense, a quick one, and I haven't um, uh, uh, fully researched this. I cribbed this from an episode, podcast episode of Planet Money um, from a couple of months ago. Um, so they were trying to figure out how we've increased our energy production over the, over the history of mankind. And um, so one historian of science pointed out that the Babylonians, for a Babylonian, right, uh, one day's wages uh, equaled enough tallow to burn, to create light in dark, at, at nighttime for 10 minutes, right? In the 19th century, when whale oil was one of the main forms of uh, energy consumption for light, you could get one hour of light for one day's worth of wages. Later in the 19th century, when kerosene became the, the main source of fuel for light at, at nighttime, five hours, you could buy five hours worth of that with one day's wages. Um, and by the 1990s, and indeed, more or less, right, right at the turn of the 20th century, you could, with, with a light bulb, you could buy, with one day's wages, you could buy 20,000 hours of, uh, of light, right? Obviously, way more than you need for a 24 hour, 12 hour period, um, by an exponential number. By, by a massive scale of magnification. So humanity really sort of changed in a, in a kind of a fundamental way when that much energy was available uh, to people on an individual basis for that little amount of work, right? And that's the era that we live in now. So electrification is a massive revolution in energy consumption and efficiency. Um, and I kind of have a theory when I think of modernism versus postmodernism first half of the 20th century. So I, I tend to think in terms of the difference between electrification for the first half and electronics on the, in the second half, right? Like, and, that, and I kind of think of that divide when I think about the difference between contemporary literature and, and, and modern literature. So that was the first reason why I focus on electricity, because it became the sign of modernity in the first half of the 20th century, and I think in some ways this remains true in the 21st century, at least in many other parts of the world, if not in the West, the main difference now being that global zones lacking in basic infrastructure like electricity now understand that lack in relation to the relative uh, reliability and richness of those infrastructures in the rich countries uh, in, the, in the north and in the west, um, like the United States. In the developed world in the 21st century, we may have lost sight of this equation of modernity and electricity, having moved on from electricity to electronics, computers, internet networks, things like that. Um, but if you look at the map of the world at night, which is the background here, right? This picture was taken, I think, in 2000. Um, uh, you can see, what you see sort of strikingly is a, a map of development and underdevelopment, right? You can see the history, actually, of colonialism, more or less, in this map. Like places that were resource-rich, had their resources mined, and moved to the great uh, centers of European and American imperialism and colonia colonialism. You can see Africa is practically completely dark, right? Um, you can, you, you're, in a sense, you're almost seeing a map of uh, where capital flows, even in the 21st century, right? where uh, Japan, China, India, Europe, and the United States are, are clearly the richest countries or zones of the world, right? And you can just see that without any other data but uh, energy, energy production, light sources, right? Um, when this is all stitched together for, into, one, into one view. Um, that's one, I mean, I, I use this map to think with all the time when I, when I try to think about electricity because I just stare at it and wonder uh, and just think about, you know, how, how that grid was created and how it's maintained. Um, but to look at this map is in some ways to visualize the paradox of economic justice. On the one hand, in terms of economic justice, we have to say that more places should have more electricity, right? Um, that seems unfair, you know? Um, and, but in that paradox is also the, the flip side of that is sustainability, right? Delivering that much electricity to places that don't have it right now in big population centers could prove ecologically catastrophic, unsustainable, even impossible te technologically, right? Like to light up everything the way the eastern seaboard is lit up in that picture um, or all the population centers would probably mean species suicide, right? Like we couldn't do it. We can't do it cleanly enough um, for the planet to survive that kind, of, that kind of social justice, oddly enough. Right? Um, so this brings me to the other reason that I'm interested in electricity is because it represents to me an interesting kind of limit case of human rights. Do people have a right to electricity the same way they have a right to water? Like I don't think there's any conflict in anybody's mind that people have a right to water, right? It's necessary to life, but how is electricity like that? Um, since electricity is far from necessary for human survival, unlike water, how do we argue for it as a human right if it's not a necessity? 
Now, there's a couple of answers to this question in both political discourse uh, and, and in literary discourse. Let me just give you a couple of examples now. Um, there's a, a grassroots group working in South Africa now uh, called Abishlali Fazem Jamdolo, uh, which agitates for the rights of urban slum dwellers in shanty towns and cities like Durban and Johannesburg and Cape Town, uh, all over uh, South Africa, right? And their spokesperson is a guy named Zibu Zakode, and he says, this is how he theorizes, I guess, uh, the, um, uh, the idea of, of access to utilities as a form of human right. He says, a living politics is not a politics that requires formal education. A living politics is a politics that is easily understood because it arises from our daily lives and the daily challenges we face. It's a politics that every ordinary person can understand. It's a politics that knows that we have no water, but that in fact we all deserve water. It's a politics that everyone must have electricity because it is required by our lives. That understanding that there are no toilets, but that in fact there should be toilets, is a living politics. It's not complicated. It does not require big books to find the information. Clearly, he's not into over-intellectualizing the question here. Um, it doesn't have a hidden agenda. It is a politics of living that is just founded only on the nature of living. Every person can understand these kinds of demands, and every person has to recognize that these demands are legitimate. Now, one of his, uh, another spokesperson for the organization um, has another way of saying it that I like a little bit better. <coughs> he says, uh, we do not need electricity, it is needed by our lives, which is really kind of a paradoxical split between ourselves and our lives, right? That doesn't solve the difficulty of claiming that electricity is a necessity. It just sort of claims it and then, and then points out just in the weird way that it's phrased that it's a problem, but it's a problem that they'd rather pass over in favor of arguing that it's a necessity for themselves, which, I, which I'm basically in favor of, right? And I think that's a, a kind of a wonderful, wonderfully ambiguous formulation that nevertheless makes a strong demand. Um, another example from real life, this one is from a, a film from 2003 uh, by director Paul Devlin. It's a documentary, it's called Power Trip. It's a documentary about trying to privatize and regularize the power grid, the power grid in post-Soviet Tbilisi in Georgia and Eastern Europe, where load shedding, which is, uh, load shedding just means rolling blackouts that are caused by excessive surges in the demand for electricity. Load shedding was plaguing the city of Tbilisi. So Devlin interviewed many residents in the city, all of whom decried the state of electrical affairs and strong by moving terms, but none so strong or moving as this one man who went so far as to say, quote, not having electricity, this is like being dead, which I thought was a, an extraordinarily strong way of making that claim. Uh, and it's not a singular instance of that sentiment, and I'm going to give you one, another one later. But the idea here is just to see that side by side with Abishlale Bazem Jamdolo's notion of electricity as one's life, that, that one's life somehow necessitates electricity, next to this Georgian man's idea that not being supplied is a lot like not being recognized, right? Like being like a kind of social death, if not, if not a real death. Um, Another emotionally charged example, this one is from fiction, is given by Balram Halwai, who's the protagonist of Aravind Adija's 2008 Booker Prize winning novel, The White Tiger. Anybody know that one? That's a good book, you should, you should check it out. Um, Balram is born a peasant in rural India, becomes a servant and driver for a local elite family, murders his master, and with the money he steals, starts up his own car service for outsourced call center workers in Bangalore. It's really a very, uh, global, a novel about globalization and global capitalism. His story is a kind of noir version of the entrepreneur's rags to riches story. If I were making a country, he says at one point, after lamenting the absence of public utilities in his village, quote, I'd get the sewer pipes first, then the democracy, then I'd go about giving out pamphlets and statues of Gandhi to other people, but what do I know? I'm just a murderer. The charge and the demand is that there is an order to the development of democracy. Certain infrastructural conditions must be met for democracy and for a felt sense of citizenship to flourish. And I would hasten to add that I'm not in agreement necessarily with him, but just, just, I'm just emphasizing the strength of the feeling, the strength of the emotion behind that desire for infrastructure, right? That it should come before politics, almost, is a pretty extraordinary sentiment. Um, <clears throat> So I don't want to belabor the point with too many examples before I come to the main ones, but, uh, and I could offer more, and we might be able to talk about more in, in the question and answer period uh, if, you, if you want to hear some more. Um, but let me shift now to a reading of uh, Mohsen Hamid's novels. So the work I'm presenting now is from a book I'm working on that I'm going to call uh, Unaccountable Growth, Postcolonial Character in Fictions of the Global South. And Life Support, 
so the chapter version of this is called Life Support, Energy, Economy, and Environment in the, in the novels of Motion Hamid. And it's a chapter dedicated to reading Hamid's three novels in terms of their strange and constant interest in the utilities infrastructure of water and power in contemporary Pakistan. Now I'm going to focus today mainly on Hamid's middle novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist from 2007, mainly because it's the one that made the biggest splash in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. But I also want to demonstrate to you that the interest in water and power is a feature of all his books, and that we can even consider them together as a kind of trilogy, co covertly dedicated to water and power. I don't know if it's intentional, I've never actually spoken to Hamid about the question, but I would venture to argue it anyway, even if he said it wasn't intentional, because it, it kind of rises out, out, of, out of the text, I think, as a unifying theme or vision. So one of the things that uh, immediately distinguishes Hamid's first novel, Moth Smoke, which otherwise concerns the downward spiral of a young Lahori named Daru into drugs and crime and prison, and was also a cult hit in Pakistan, it was a huge uh, best-selling novel, it's the remarkable narrative attention paid to electricity, and particularly to air conditioning, and this novel set in Lahore, which is obviously very hot. A month after getting canned from his job as a banker, the protagonist, Daru, has his electricity cut off for a failure to pay. Much of what motivates him for the rest of the novel is his desire to get his electricity and his air conditioning back. His excessive attachment to his air conditioner has its narratively heavy-handed origins in his childhood. He believes that his mother's early death is the result of a lack of air conditioning. His mother was actually killed by a stray bullet while sleeping on the roof of her apartment building, where she, want, where she went to escape the suffocating heat in her apartment on the summer nights when the load shedding shut down the AC for, for the evening. Um, Daru believes that his mother would be alive if only load shedding hadn't shut down her AC and forced her onto the roof that night. And so the moral panic that he feels about getting his own AC working again, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, getting his own AC working again by paying his electric bill is rooted in his mother's death. While I find it interesting that Moss Smoke is structured around a trauma of load shedding, I also find it a kind of, to be a kind of an immature version, uh, if that's not too harsh, of, of what he's doing in the later two books. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just wanted you to point that out, that it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing theme. Um, because we're going to see this rooted relationship to electricity again and again. But I should say here that Moss Smoke also contains very, very funny extended passages about the feeling and meaning of air conditioning in Pakistan. <coughs> Instead of rich and poor, the whole, the whole world of the novel is divided between people who have AC and people who don't have AC, and long excursions into uh, why some people don't get, you know, it just it goes on. It's very, very funny. Um, there's a lot to unpack here about the recent history of Pakistan's electrical problems, much of it opaque to Hamid's Western audiences here in the States and in England. In tacit acknowledgment of that, that knowledge deficit, Hamid explains one of his character's decisions to move permanently back from New York to Lahore, as in part due to it. So this character, Mumtaz, who's the love interest, uh, leaves New York and goes back to Lahore because, as she explains, um, uh, she wanted, she was, I can't, I, she wanted a quiet conversation with someone who knew what load shedding was. In other words, she was lonely for her uh, compatriots back home, right? Um, it's a profoundly weird sentiment, even more so because it actually implies something a bit different from what it says, I think. It's not so much that Mumtaz wishes to speak to someone who knows what load shedding is, as that she wishes to, to speak with someone who knows how load shedding feels. This posits the electrical grid as, an ima as imaginatively binding a group of people. On the one hand, load shedding is the collective result of everyone running their air conditioners all at once, a failure of the system that is also an insistent reminder that you are never the only one using it. And on the other hand, load shedding is a collective experience that, however inconvenient, binds you into a kind of mutual understanding with your fellow grid sharers. Frustration as fellow feeling, right? The opposite of what we're normally used to, right? This is the last thing I feel when I'm stuck in traffic is fellow feeling, in fact. <laughs> something like the opposite of that thing. Um, but here, frustration as fellow feeling, simultaneous collective electrical failure as the lightning bolt of modern social animation. Uh, people tend to feel like a collective somehow. The syntax of Mumtaz's yearning is a kind of technological rewriting of Victor Hugo's quip about the theater. And we could say, just to modify it, in a rolling blackout, the moth becomes a people. Um, Victor Hugo said, in the theater, the moth becomes a people. So now I'm going to present a reading of Hamid's second novel that reads it in light of Pakistan's electricity crisis and the question of resources and resource wars. This is from 2007. And it's already, in many ways, a fully consecrated part of the canon of world literature in the United States. And I say that because 
uh, from the point of view of universities, it's been used as one of those freshman texts in many uh, universities. It's like, um, it's like, the, it's like uh, uh, your fellow in New Jersey, and, uh, do you know Diaz's uh, uh, The Brief Wonder's Wife of Oscar Wilde? Like, universities across, across the country have adopted it as a kind of introductory text uh, to the liberal arts. Partly because it's called, um, uh, it's part of a, a genre called the 9-11 novel, which, it, which it, it has, has a lot of uh, practitioners. The reluctant fundamentalist concerns a character named Changez, a middle-class Pakistani national from Lahore who goes to Princeton for college and lands a plum job on Wall Street as a corporate evaluator. While working for a client in Manila, he sees the World Trade Center destroyed on his hotel TV. And on returning to New York, he, he's, he gets uh, strip searched by, um, uh, by immigration. Um, he loses interest in his job, is disillusioned with U.S. imperialism and his life in the U.S goes back to Lahore, becomes a university professor, and a leading activist against the U.S. occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Formally speaking, Changez's story matches very closely uh, with Conrad's Heart of Darkness, in a way. It's a, that kind of framed story where he's telling the story about his past in New York to a, an American CIA agent, and they're sitting in the cafe in Lahore together. It also matches Albert Camus' The Fall, in a certain way. Changez tells the story to this unnamed American stranger while they're both sitting in the cafe in Lahore in the manner of Marlowe recounting his journey up the Congo River to his shipmates while docked in the tenants. This frame narrative allows for interruptions of the frame narrative. Sorry, this, this is hard to hear, actually. This frame narrative allows for in interruptions of the framed narrative by, by the waiter in the restaurant coming to take their order, the arrival of their food, tea afterwards, the smell of jasmine, all these sort of sensory perceptions that waft in and out of the story and bring them into the present, right, as opposed to talking about the past. Um, and at one point, a brief interruption of the city's electrical supply as a result of load shedding, which Pakistan has suffered for, uh, uh, for the past many years, uh, even decades. Um, so this is Changez talking to the American. What bad luck, the lights have gone. But why do you leap to your feet? See, the American's scared, even though he's not experienced it. Uh, don't be alarmed, sir. Fluctuations and blackouts are common in Pakistan. Ah, they're back, thank goodness. It was nothing but a momentary disruption. Now, uh, right, there's nothing but a momentary disruption. Now this, uh, did I read what's up there? Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> I can't actually see that far. I didn't think that was reading this before. Right? Um, now this momentary blackout, it interrupts the story the narrator's telling, but it also propels it. Electricity is central to it, in fact. In this instance, though, because it is grouped together with other more or less normal kinds of interruptions, like the waiter and the food arriving, etc., um, it seems to offer something like local color for the visiting tourist. It's like a distraction from the mounting hostility between the American uh, and Changez that, that's actually being narrated, right? Changez is convinced, that, is worried that this, the, the American guy might be a CIA, CIA agent sent there to kill him, and the, uh, the American guy is worried that Changez is a terrorist who might at any second kill him while they're sitting in this cafe. Um, but the blackouts are different than the rest of those other distractions. They don't, they don't appear as part, just part of the quaint tourist story about the authentically easygoing or casual attitude of native Lahoreans to their electricity problem. In the framed story, the trouble with public utilities in Pakistan figures instead the narrator's rage, his volatile mixture of shame and pride that for Marshall Berman, in his book, uh, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, produces what he calls the, under, the underdeveloped identity. Berman used this term to talk about uh, German romantics back right in the early 19th century, who, uh, who were angry at the rest of Europe because it was developing sort of as, as, an industri as industrial nations much faster. Than, than Germany at the time. Um, a telling moment is when Changez describes his sense of awe in the lobby of his new employer in New York, a moment of troubling comparison for him between the two countries. Often, during my stay in your country, such comparisons troubled me. They made me resentful. 4,000 years ago, we the people of the Indus River Basin had cities that were laid out on grids and boasted underground sewers. Now our cities were largely unplanned, unsanitary affairs, and America had universities with individual endowments greater than our national budget for education. To be reminded of this vast disparity was, for me, to be ashamed. And I might also add angry and hateful. And this is one of the, this is one of those moments where I always, uh, whenever I'm talking to professors of comparative literature, I like to say, you know, sometimes we forget that a lot of <laughs> the feelings that motivate comparative literature are not always happy, multicultural ones, they're sometimes angry ones, right? They're, because it is about comparison, and here it's about envy and, uh, and hatred. Um, later, on a trip home to see his family, he once again feels ashamed when he sees his family's house 
in light of the, in the light of the an afternoon without electricity, an afternoon of load, load shedding. So he's, he comes from a sort of shabby, genteel family. They once had money, they don't anymore. They had enough to send him to Princeton, <coughs> but now they're essentially poor. Um, the electricity had gone out that afternoon, giving the place a gloomy air. I was saddened to find it in such a state. No, more than saddened, I was ashamed. I was ashamed. This is where I came from. This was my providence, and it smacked of lowliness. Later, still in the novel, just when he's about to decide, oh, this, sorry, that's the part of my talk. Um, so I was going to say that um, there's a way in which his narration of his house always kind of mimics his sense of the nation itself, right? That the house it has a lack of electricity, but also Pakistan as a nation has a big electricity problem, as, as a national problem. Um, so later in the novel, just when he's about to decide to leave his job and go home, the shame he feels turned into a felt need for action. Uh, moreover, he says, our house's main water connection had ruptured. The pipes were long overdue for replacement, and the pressure was so low that it had become impossible to take a shower. This caused me to reflect again on the absurdity of my situation, being two hemispheres, if such a thing is possible, from home at a time when my family was in need. With the idea of going home to help his family, the public utilities and their state of unreliability, encourage Chagas to return home to help with the oikos, that's the Greek word for, eco for house, actually, but it's also the root word for economy, as in national economy. So we're now we're, we're in a sort of allegorical space where the house is supposed to represent the nation as a whole. Um, and, with the interruption, and with the interruptions of public lighting, the theme of the national economy is here, as I said, um, evoked. And they're both, they're married in the figure of the electric grid. <coughs> so here's the crux of my interpretation of this novel. Um, first of all, when we read this novel in the States, uh, as I said, it was sort of canonized for its reference to 9-11, for the way it narrated this character's change of heart after 9-11, from being pro-American to being anti-American. Um, but I don't actually think the novel's about that. I think it's about this question of the national infrastructure of Pakistan. That's kind of what I'm trying to argue. Um, so early in the book, uh, uh, while well, uh, Changez and the American are sitting in the cafe, the American notices a scar on Changez's arm, and he thinks Changez is quick to defend it because it might be a scar from like repelling from from sort of like basically terrorist training camp, right? So he's quick to try to explain it away, and this is this is how he explains it. I see you've noticed the scar on my forearm here, where the skin is both darker and smoother than that which surrounds it. I've been told it looks like a rope burn, not dissimilar to marks on the bodies of those who have taken up repelling, perhaps. You are wondering what sort of training camp could have given a fellow from the plains, such as myself, cause to engage in these activities. Allow me then to reassure you that the source of my injury was rather prosaic. We have in this country a phenomenon which, with which you will doubtless be unfamiliar given the state of plenty that characterizes your homeland. Here, particularly in the winter, when the reservoirs of the Great Dams are almost dry, we face a shortage of electricity that manifests itself in rolling blackouts. We call this load shedding, and we care for, keep our homes well stocked with candles so that it does not unduly disrupt our lives. As a child, during such a time of load shedding, I grabbed hold of one of these, those candles, tipped it over, and spilled molten wax on myself. It resulted merely in an evening of crying and the rather faint, if oddly linear, scar you see today. As readers, we don't know if Changez's explanation of his scar is true or not. Hamid writes Changez's point of view to encourage our suspicion that he may be an unreliable narrator. So it might actually be a, a, a scar from like a, a training camp of some sort. Is he a terrorist in training? Or, if the scar is true, is it an alibi for a suspected terrorism, or rather an explanation of it, right? As, as motivated by its youthful experience of Pakistan's economic backwardness by comparison to his experience in the United States. We're not told, and so the moment marks a rather interesting blankness in the text. But let's for a, mo a moment entertain the story as if it were the case. As if it were another, as if this were not just a charming anecdote about growing up in a poor country, right? as if it didn't explain away his hatred somehow. Uh, Changez appears to be fondly mem remembering a childhood trauma put in adult perspective. Nothing serious, he says, merely a night of crime, and even remembered with a bit of nostalgia. But it's a hard perspective to maintain, given the pathos and the shame he feels for the family's broken house, for his whole country in comparison to the great cities in the US, and those quotes that I've shown you before. In fact, I want to suggest that that oddly linear scar on Changez's arm, if we're reading allegorically in any case, is oddly linear because it is, in fact, a kind of crude map of Pakistan's electrical grid, which it must, given its description, closely resemble. So this is just a close-up of the slide. I can't, I'm not tall enough to point that high. But you see that little swingle right to the, to the left of, Pac of India there? That is 
the uh, electrical corridor, the light lighting at the border between the, the hostile border, right, between Pakistan and India. And I would call that oddly linear. No, uh, if th I mean this is kind of speculative, right? But so um, the, so there's the border in black and in blue is the Indus River, which is the, sp the, the hydroelectric spine, right, of uh, of Pakistan. It's where all the hydroelectric dams and all the generation plants are. So even if you took both those as the oddly linear scar, right, you'd still have a kind of swath in the middle that might resemble what we see. Obviously, it's a work of fiction. We don't see the scar. I'm just speculating on what it might look like and what it might actually mean uh, in, in the book. So oddly, it happens in the context of a blackout, so it makes sense that it would have something to do with electricity. And we know that as an adult, Chang is seriously engaged and enraged by Pakistan's electric, electricity problems from all the proof that I've already shown you. So I'm, I'm proposing that we call this scar the character of development, which as you'll remember is my title. And, uh, is, I, I mean that in, in a sort of punning way to think about characters. <laughs> the character of a person, but also a character like a mark, a scar, uh, a letter, or something like that. Um, and that, so that brings us sort of back to the beginning, and we can recall, um, for those of you who are literary scholars who might know Eric Auerbach's book, My Mises, um, in there he talks about the scar of Odysseus, right, when Odysseus comes back to Ithaca at the very end of the Odyssey. Um, he's in disguise, but his nursemaid recognizes him because of a scar on his thigh. So I think this is like a way of signifying Changez as this kind of fictional savior for Pakistan through, through electricity. Um, to think of the scar as the mark of the king or the sovereign, now in this case not a fundamentalist at all, at least not a religious fundamentalist, as the title of the book would lead you to believe, uh, but a developer. I want to suggest that the reluctant fundam in the reluctant fundamentalist, the electrical grid, both the real one and the one imprinted on Changez's forearm, is uh, in, in another uh, literary critic's terms, um, kind of a black hole that animates plot and meaning since it provokes the reader's search, right? It's a kind of a black box that, out of which the, the narrative tension of this book is from which it's generated. Thus, the oddly linear scar on Chang'e's arm becomes something rather magical since it marks the suture of the is he or is he question. Is he a terrorist or is he not, right? It's insolubility, because we can't really know from within that, but we can know to what it refers. Um, so Chang'e's oddly linear scar is a character, as in a letter or a mark of underdeveloped, a cipher of what is uh, it was called in policy literature the water energy net uh, the, the water energy nexus. And more recently, but usually in governments goes under the name of the Department of Water and Power. Right? Um, if Chang'e's dissimulates anywhere in the passage, it may be when he claims disingenuously that the source of his injury is rather pro rather prosaic. I forget what that is in that, but it's in that quote. A quick check on prosaic in Webster's online dictionary reveals the first definition as not poetic, and the second as mundane, common, everyday. The source of the scar may, be, may indeed be prosaic in the sense that electricity is an everyday technology that one tends to take for granted when it works. But in a country like Pakistan, right, uh, it can't be taken for granted because it does, they have regularly recurring blackouts. Right? It's, not, it's not constant. It's not something one can forget. It's not prosaic, in other words. Um, the oddly linear scar, on the other hand, is not prosaic, it's magical, and its generic purview is not the realist novel, even. I mean, this is where the, the novel comes, you know, takes on a kind of magical property, but maybe something like epic or romance, right, the return of the king, or, or kind of savior figure for, for the country. As it turns out, Hamid wrote the reluctant fundamentalist before 9-11, actually, but rewrote it afterwards so that 9-11 might appear to be the narrative fault, it, um, the, 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 the sort of animating moment, right? It's probably the case that the deep structure of the book revolves around this other thing about electricity. I think it does, anyway. Um, but the success of the book as world literature here in the U.S. is likely due largely to the inclusion of 9-11. So it's, a, it's an interesting instance of how this sort of popular reception is, in a way, a misreading of, of, of the book. Um, especially because U.S. readers, in general, don't have a real experience of the unreliability of the national grid, except uh, maybe here in the Northeast Corridor, um, in 2003, two years after 9-11. Some of you will remember the, uh, the big blackout that happened that summer, um, which was, interestingly enough, first blamed on terrorists, right, in that, in that moment right after 9-11. And then when it turned out that terrorists couldn't possibly have done it, uh, the media decided to blame Canadians, or Canada in general, for that. Um, and then when that failed, it turned out it was just Ohio. <laughs> and, uh, and then a year later was responsible for giving us the second term of uh, <laughs> George Bush. But anyway. Um, 
Therefore, in, in the U.S., we're likely to miss the point, I think, uh, unless we sort of refer back to these, these other experiences. The mark a character of development on Chang'e's is R. Marxism is a developer, in particular a developer of, na of the national electrical grid, and it's generative, I think, to think of this, this way for many reasons because it marks him as an infrastructural fundamentalist as opposed to a religious one or an economic one. Um, and it's interesting too, the way it does, because this, this idea that the scar is a mark, is, is, or something like a tattoo, means that it it's precisely goes against Islam, right? Because it's, it's, it's forbidden in most forms of Islam to, uh, to have tattoos. Um, so it rules out religious fundamentalism in a, in a kind of surreptitious way. Um, and because it marks him in epic romantic fashion as a king or a leader of his people, even through the sign of energy development, someone concerned with economic de development as a human right, or to put it in 21st century terms, um, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, to put it in 21st century terms, uh, to think of electricity as a human right, or to put it in modernist terms, as someone who equates uh, national modernity, the, the modernization of, of Pakistan with, with electricity. And also, uh, another critic informed me recently that uh, Chang'e is Urdu for uh, Genghis Khan. So uh, another way in which he's linked to these sort of huge emperor, king, uh, you know, mythical uh, figures. Um, in April of 2010, Pakistan entered a new and more dire phase of electricity crisis that got extensive coverage in the mainstream media, with riots, uh, electricity rationing, which amounts to about 12 hours a day. It's even worse now, actually. Um, school closures and all of that. Uh, the Obama administration pledged a billion dollars in aid, and so far from not being not unduly disrupted by blackouts, um, as Chanka said earlier, right? Life in Pakistan in this novel appears to be defined by them, and people's livelihoods and lives are actually at stake. And I promised you a sequel to the uh, 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 "It Feels Like Being Dead" quote from Tbilisi, right? I saw one. The New York Times ran a video report about the, the crisis in Pakistan. And they did have a guy who was running a printing press come on and say, uh, he said, he actually said, I want to die. Um, but I mean, you know, these are extreme, extreme feelings. He was talking about the failure of his business and his inability to support his family, right? Um, not just you know, not having light, but I mean, the, the point was, was clear, right? The economy can't function, a modern economy can't function without, without electricity. Um, The crisis is not over, um, and in 2013, um, the, the uh, Minister of Water and Power for Pakistan told Time Magazine, if we do not solve the energy problem in the next three or four years, Pakistan won't be safe. We will ultimately end up with no electricity, no water, no employment, no money. This is very critical to our survival. Again, this analogy to death, right, or uh, kind of social death. <coughs> um, Minister Asif's desire, or di sorry, Minister Asif's dire prognostications for Pakistan's future are the allegorical subject of Hamid's latest novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, which is, in, by the way, an incredible title for a novel, um, from 2013 also. <coughs> the novel, written in the second person and with the conceit of an entrepreneurial how-to business book, is written as if it were one of those very popular how-to business books. Um, Concerns an unnamed narrator from an unnamed country, though Lahore and Pakistan are more or less recognizable here. But we're definitely moving into more and more allegorical ter territory as we move through Hamid's body of work. Um, the narrator rises from a poor peasant existence as a boy by harvesting used plastic water bottles, refilling them with boiled tap water, resealing and reselling them. This private enterprise succeeds, and the business expands to the point of corporate legitimacy, which is really to say that it just gets bigger and bigger and more and more criminal as it runs into the sort of mafia-like uh, organization of other people trying to sell water, and he sort of muscles his way in to uh, violence, right? It becomes a highly successful uh, water, water seller, I suppose. Um, so this, that's, well, that's the cover of the book. And then the, uh, uh, this is him describing the arc of his life, right? Um, but again, remember, it's in the second person, so it has this weird uh, way of addressing you. It's a kind of an experimental form of fiction where the main character is on I, it's a you, every time, right? Um, you, have thrived, you have thrived to the sound of the city's great whooshing thirst, unsated and growing, water incessantly being pulled out of the ground and pushed into pipes and containers. Bottled hydration has proved lucrative. So that's, uh, this is his sort of entrepreneurial scheme, right, to sell water to people. Now, why does he need to sell water to people? It's because the public infrastructure for water is next to non-existent, the water is dangerous, right? So he's able to make money out of it. Um, 
Okay, great. The unnamed narrator of How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia can be read as another permutation of the character of development or the character of the developer that we see emerging in the reluctant fundamentalist. But here, of course, we are focused on water, not electricity, and here the protagonist is a reflection of the actual path of development in Pakistan, which is, say, private, right, uh, or privatized, and uh, not the ideal one intimated by Changez and the reluctant fundamentalist. One of the narrator's last projects involved a involves a housing development referred to in the quote as 10, or uh, number 10, uh, that is essentially a gated community of access to water and power services that divides the paying inhabitants from the rest of the country's citizens and immerses them in a US-inspired fantasy of electrical and hydrological plenitude. Here the narrator is listening to the sales pitch of the lead developer about the virtues of number 10. Other premier housing societies are installing electricity plants. We're rolling them out across all our phases in all our cities. No, what's going to make 10 unique and why you're here is water. Water. In 10, when you turn the tap, you'll be able to drink what comes out of it. Everywhere. In your garden. In your kitchen. In your bathroom. Drinkable water. When you enter phase 10, it'll be like you're, you've entered another country, another continent. Like you've gone to Europe or North America. Without leaving your home, your mother-in-law says. Exactly. Without leaving your home. You'll, sit, you'll still be here, but in a secure, walled-off, impeccably maintained, lit up at night, noise-controlled, perfectly regulated version of here. An inspiration for the entire country, and for our countrymen abroad, too. Where even the water is as good as the best. We're all class. It's, there's, a, there's a weird, upsetting kind of uh, self-loathing behind all this, right? Where the, the idea of just water and electricity in a, in, a, in a regularized way, mode of delivery, is likened to the U.S., right? World class, as if Pakistan itself were somehow not world class, and that was a background belief, a kind of habit of belief below all this, right? Um, which is disturbing. Not, I mean, but not only that, but also this whole setup, right? Of, of, a, a sort of broader public that has no access to these things or very limited access versus the very rich who can pay for world-class access to, uh, to water and power. Um, here we see a first world fantasy walled off from and nestled within third world scarcity. The people who live in 10 do not want to know what load shedding is and they certainly don't want to remember what it feels like. But even the narrator seems not to care about the social and economic injustice his schemes promote. He seems to be Wait, even if the narrator seems not to care about the social and economic injustice the schemes promote, he seems to become aware, as he is dying at the end of the novel, of the way societies or national imagined communities live and die by the extent to which they are able to provide basic necessities for their citizens, basic entitlements like water, gas, and electricity. In fact, by putting together the electricity plants and the water supply here in this passage about private development, the narrator shows us an absence where there should be a presence where we see two private developers talking about a gated community, perhaps we should see, instead, uh, the Ministry for Water, the Minister for Water and Power, or Tongas, or Minister Asif, or something like that. Like, some dedicated government organization that would be in charge of providing this for everybody, as opposed to private developers who are only providing it to paying customers, right? Um, so as, he is, as the narrator here is dying comfortably in his private hospital with state-of-the-art boutique medical care and equipment, because he's like a billionaire by this point, um, and, and the narrator then, at the end of his very long and very lucrative life, feels a surge of elemental connectedness through the technological prostheses that are right then keeping him alive, the machines that he's hooked up to keep him, to keep him alive. Um, to be a man whose life requires being plugged into machines, multiple machines, in your case, interfaces, electrical, gaseous, and liquid, is to experience the shock of an unseen network suddenly made physical as a fly experiences a cobweb. As his internal workings fail, they are externalized as machines, and their operation is, for the first time in his life, an object of fascination and terror, or simply and understandably profound ambivalence. Seeing the network upon which his life depends, the narrator feels mortally caught up in it, quote, as a fly experiences a cobweb. Age and illness alienate the body from the self, and so the body's continued functioning becomes the object of cognitive work and worry. Youth and health, by extension, generally imply the opposite. They mean not having to think about how one's body works or worry that it won't. In juxtaposing the thoughts of the dying narrator of how to get healthy rich in rising Asia with the national diagnosis from Pakistan's Minister for Water and Power, and here it is, uh, I mean to suggest that Hamid's narrator, whose work involved bottling and selling purified water in an increasingly water starved country, is meant in life as in death as a stand in for his country. 
the, the, quote, the interfaces, electrical, gaseous, and liquid that are, that are hooked into the narrator's body are actually biological translations here of the infrastructural triumvirate of water, gas, and electricity that, that we so easy to rehearse, right? I don't know why. It's just like a commonplace. Um, Pakistan has an energy problem, says the minister, the solving of which is critical to our survival. It's perhaps no mere accident that the cessation of extraordinary measures of life support is in English colloquially referred to as pulling the plug. For one thing, the metaphor tells us something about how we think or fail to think about electricity or about water and power, about how they come to seem, and never more urgently than when they fail, essential forms of life support. So if there are any questions for Professor King, you would be happy to answer them, I think. I would be. <laughs> How to get filthy rich in rising Asia, and you were talking about him at the end, and how he is uh, you used the term technological prosthesis to stay alive. It reminded me of the distinction you were making at the beginning about modernism and postmodernism, and electricity and electronics. Yeah. And I was curious about kind of how that plays with life and death as well, because as you're pointing out, just just the phrase "pull the plug" implies a certain kind of life dependency on electronics yeah and if you've thought about that relationship and in particular in the last one i think it was the most apparent but in either of the other two novels you're pointing at something that is a big blind spot for me in the sense that i know that uh, when we talk about like network dependency in terms of the internet that's a huge huge topic it's a brand new topic right um, and it certainly goes, and that's definitely an infrastructure that's totally germane to what I'm doing. The reason, though, that I tend to shy away from this is because, is because of the, because of underdevelopment, right? I feel like, at, at our at our peril, do we move away from questions of water and gas and electricity when that, those are not established rights uh, of economic justice, right? Um, it, it seems to me that there's so much more to be said about the electric era, even in the 21st century, that I, made, I just made a decision to kind of stay on that side, at least until I had elucidated it to my own satisfaction. But I know, I mean, there's a world of stuff about that that is fascinating that I, I mean, I can, I mean, I'm just kind of an arm, armchair theorist in that stuff, right? Like, I mean, you know, I spend too many hours on Facebook, I know. I know what you're talking about, <laughs> but I don't John know. John Marshall does something about it. <laughs> but, but it's not, I don't know how to comment on it with any expertise whatsoever, but I see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Good question. Did, did, so, knowing that your earlier work, you know, your work with our show, did, did uh, Hamid work find you, or did you find it? I mean, because it, it seems so wonderful for your work. I mean, what did it? Not, not, you know. I came across Hamid only because I saw Lee Ron Medavoy give a talk. He's a, he's a, he was a professor now at Arizona State University. He gave a talk on the book at a panel I went to at MLA one year. And it, and it sounded awesome, and so I read it, and then um, and then I wanted to give a paper on it, and like for you know three or four days, I had no idea what to say about this book. And then I, I just had to start rereading it because I could not think of anything to say. And then I found that passage about the scar, which is at the beginning of the book, and I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, this is this is really. I'm but it's such a match with your work. earlier work. I mean, yeah. you do all your work, but I mean, his work is. Yeah, I got lucky with that one, and I'm looking. I'm always looking for to expand an archive of works that do this. There's another book that, at the end of my book, the last chapter, I talk about this novel called Mexico, which is a, a more or less contemporary book about a shanty town in Martinique, where they the whole book, the sort of narrative arc, is about them getting electricity by the end of the book, um, and I, you know, but. Uh, in terms of books that are that structurally and that formally built around my thing, like those come up rarely. I have only a handful of examples, but, but those are two of them, so um, I'm, I'm always hoping to find more. Yes? So uh, this is really more of a comment and maybe a suggestion. I was trying to remember this book. So there's a, uh, thanks, thank you, Internet. There's a famous passage in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Let me just read it to you. Okay. Quote, a linen shirt 
is strictly speaking not necessary of life, not a necessity of life. Hold on, I'm sorry, a living what? A linen shirt. A linen shirt. shirt. Okay, right. Is strictly speaking not a necessity of life. The Greeks and Romans lived, I suppose, very comfortably, though they had no linen. But in the present time, through the greater part of Europe, a credible day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt, the one of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty which it is presumed nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct. So that seems apropos of the thing of the talk because I've been kind of puzzling about what the human rights basis for right to electricity is. Of course, human rights is founded on this idea of dignity. So the implicit argument in your talk seems to be that for, uh, for these authors and for many people that they're representing, the lack of electricity is understood as a affront to their people. That, it's, it's, that it can't, that they don't feel, they feel ashamed to be, you know, in public and to admit that, that they lack this fundamental accoutrement of modern life. And, and you know, in Smith's uh, example, it was a, a living shirt by which one could appear to be a proper gentleman in polite society in, in England. Whereas in these novels you, you've analyzed for us, it, it, it really is uh, amenities that people in the developed world take for granted, but which are obviously lacking in many of the developing countries. And, 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 and the issue is, it's about dignity. It's about being able to hold your head up and say, you know, I'm, I'm the equal of these others. Yeah. Social recognition, yeah. Right. Well, I guess the two answers that uh, one is that I would, I would do, I would special, I would specially plead, would make a special plea for electricity as a marker of this dignity because of its uh, intimate tie, metaphorically and uh, with with uh, enlightenment revolution. Right, electricity is more or less a huge topic, right, in the time of the American and the French Revolution, and it's tied with a sort of vitalization and an enormous revolutionary energy of that time. So it's tied to democratic society, you know, in, at least in the West, in that way. And it is it exported that way? Um, and Césaire, in his, uh, his uh, poem, Retur uh, Notebook of a Return to a Native Land, talks about the convocation of conquest. And he, he basically says, you know, uh, we didn't discover electricity, and we didn't invent a lot of this stuff, but we had every, every bit of right to it as anybody else. Like, this is, and that, his term for that is the complication of conquest, which I think is kind of good. Um, so yeah, so I think there's a, there's a way in which electricity is more important than the linen shirt. Even though, because what he's talking about is the social pressure of, of um, what's the word? Uh, you know, uh, displaying your cultural capital, it's like fashion competition or something. Um, understandable, but not as, I mean, maybe not as important anyway as no, like, no, the latest. I, I actually, I think you're right, because I don't think that's a sufficient basis for claiming there's a human right to electricity. So there are two other ways of, of, of you know, supporting that claim. I can think of one is sort of in Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says everyone has a right to a standard of liberty, yeah. adequate to health of themselves and their family. So, in the modern world, in order to make a living and enjoy an adequate standard of living, one does need access to electric power. Yeah. So that's that's a stronger basis, actually, for there being a right to electricity, or access to electric power, than the dignity argument. Although it seemed to me from the quotes you chose, it was more linked to this idea of shame and self-respect than just adequate standard of living. Article 27 says everyone has a right to take part in the cultural life of the community, enjoy the arts and 
and share in the benefits of scientific and technological advancement. So that's, I think, the most direct basis for it. Mm -hmm. right, that, that as science and technology advances, then the benefits of that need to be distributed broadly and ultimately universally so that everyone can benefit from that project. That principle is most markedly important in the pharmaceutical realm, where, you know, in medical ethics and bioethics, when they develop a new drug or a new treatment for a disease, it becomes unethical to deprive people of access to that medicine, particularly if it's life-saving. Yeah. And all the debates about treatment for HIV and malaria and all these other polio shots all driven by the, by the sense that once these scientific breakthroughs ha happen, then everybody gets an entitlement to those benefits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I haven't, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the, uh, my, like, a lot of my source material comes out of poetry and novels. Yeah, no, I, I, I find the justification I'm there. I'm a, I'm a that, moral philosopher, so I, Right, right, right. <laughs> no, I mean, and I I'm should. I'm not a literary guy, but, you know, so I'm just, Puzzling well, it happens that that stuff is yeah. hugely important for discussions of human rights in literature now. And um, uh, yeah, so th that's very useful to me, actually, to look at the actual articles that define either dignity or participation or access. Because that, that should be the next stage of my project, actually, is to link it yeah. to, the, to the, the discourse of human rights more, more closely. It does raise an interesting question, though, um, thinking back again to the very beginning of your talk where you were talking about the, uh, when you had the map first up, and uh, you were talking about the environmental cost mm -hmm. that putting light all over that map would be in terms of uh, dignity of technology, <coughs> what is the environmental, and you don't have to have an answer to this question, but you know, it raises the question for me at least, what is the environmental cost of, how, can we reconfigure what dignity is tied to technology means so that it doesn't also uh, lead to the extinction of the universe? Uh, can we reconfigure? Well, you, I mean, you, you don't have to have it. No, I know. I mean, I, but I've thought about these these questions, but no, no more issue than <laughs> could, could be expected. <laughs> but like, I mean, there's there's a lot of different answers. Like Dipesh Chakrabarty just came out with an essay a couple days ago in Critical Inquiry. That basically said, no one wants to touch the topic of population in post-colonial studies, but I'm going to touch it now because, you know, because of anthropogenic global warming, we can't just say everybody needs to electricity. We, just, we can't say that. Right? It's not sustainable. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really kind of provocative article, especially for a historian who comes out of the post-colonial yeah. uh, social justice movements, right, to be saying something like to be saying, forget about the difference between a developed and underdeveloped world. Now, there is another actor on the stage, man as like a, or humanity as a global actor, and that's more important now. It even points out that global warming and the Great Acceleration is co-temporal with decolonization. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's very polemical in this, in this essay. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know where he gets us exactly. Um, you know, uh, but there are, there are also uh, geoengineered fixes. Like, electricity production is undergoing a massive change. And I'm not a science, I'm not an engineer, so I'm going to get a lot. Of, I'm not even going to try to say any technical terminology. But I just was listening to an episode of Frontiers, the BBC podcast, about. Um, switching back to direct current and sending electricity over long distances and sending it underwater. Um, in, in other words, using the continents to send electricity. Back. But crazily enough, in that episode, the thing that was missing is why is there not, I mean, between Spain you know, and Africa, it would be an easy way to check. That wasn't, that wasn't mentioned. But the technology is starting to be there to do massive, huge loads of electricity with low, low cost and low, low emissions. Right? It, it, it's coming. Uh, Maybe only to Europe, which would be that would become a question for the ethicists, right, or for the for, for, for politics. But so it may still be possible. I, before I heard that, I was convinced that the, the electricity grid would be a thing of the past with green technology, right? That you just wouldn't use it; you'd use local things, you know, <coughs> batteries or something. But I I'm not sure that that's the only way either. Neither was Tesla. <laughs> 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 um, so I just wanted to thank you for a really, really interesting talk. Um, the examples that you gave on your slide define the problem of electricity in a consistent way. 
that that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. That the problem that by using the term load shedding and focusing on 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 a lack of reliability as the problem, it 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 it, it defines the, the issue of electricity in in a, in a certain kind of way. That the problem is not that it doesn't reach everybody. The problem is that there is a system that is there that does not work. Right. And I'm interested in, in how that would compare with, say, let's say, take South Africa, for example, where um, one of the big issues after the end of apartheid is that electricity had never been provided to places. And so there's a big push on the ANC government to provide electricity to new places. And so there, the problem of a lack of, a lack of electricity is defined in a different sort of way. And I'm wondering if, in the examples that you provided, that there is a certain kind of, of that there's a, a reason why this kind of scarcity is defined in this particular way. Is it about yeah. an antagonism toward the state or toward institutions that should be providing something that are not? Or well, essentially, yeah, there's a neo-liberal impulse to privatize everything. Um, but so, well, thank you for the question. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So I, when I was defining electricity in the later part of the 20th century, I was saying, we only notice it when it goes out because we're so used to it being there. Well, in that period where I initially started my research, the exact opposite was the case. In Ireland, for example, Ireland produced the, the biggest, the biggest hydroelectric dam in the world for all of about 20 minutes when they built their dam in, in 1927, right, um, on the Shannon River. And they did it as this huge national project to promote national pride and to bring electricity. And it was all couched in the language of enlightenment, or bring, you know, you can, you can farm during the day, you know, you have your, your rural peasants will farm during the day, and they'll go home and they'll study at night, because they can now, because they'll have a light bulb in their house, and isn't this great? And, you know, we're going to raise the country um, up through this, this kind of education and, and enlightenment. Um, but people were initially terrified. They didn't, nobody knew that they wanted electricity, right? I mean, back then they were like, well, no, we don't. I think that the dam, when it first went online, it produced like 10 times more electricity than was even there were even lines for that was even in use. Right? People were convinced that they were going to be electrocuted. There was all kinds of fear mongering that they would just die in their houses as soon as it was strung in. You know, I mean, it was it was a totally different scene. So what you're what you're saying to me about South Africa is fascinating, and I don't know that much about these new electricity projects where where it hadn't been before and that it was moving in. I would love to to research that because in Ireland they would have priests and government officials would go to these towns and they would read out these pompous, you know, <laughs> quasi-religious tracts about God lighting up their town. And then somebody would throw a big switch and all the lights would come on at once and everybody would celebrate. And they were, they were huge, huge celebrations. When, when they turned on Arden Krusha, the big dam, they had a priest come uh, and he talked about the turbines as like God, Jesus' engines. I mean, it was, it was about this amazing, you know, thing. And then they, they opened the gates and then all the lights come on. I mean, there was this mystical, I mean, electricity was a, a force of wonder. I guess that's my bottom line point. I, that's not what's happening, you're right. It's absolutely not what's happening in, in common. It's, it's a source of frustration only when it's not there. Everybody expects it to be there. But in the early part of the 20th century, everybody was like, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened, right? Uh, it's gonna change everything. And it did, and then nobody noticed anymore <laughs> because they just got used to it. So, so it'd be interesting in the case you're talking about. Yeah, in the case of South Africa, you got actually a very interesting Flip, because within 20 years, the grid is overextended, there's insufficient generating capacity, and you get rolling blackouts, and you get a similar kind of language to what you described here. Right. So very, very quickly, you, you, get, you, you, you get that coming, but 20 years before, the, it wasn't, that it doesn't work with it, it never been. Yeah, that's fascinating. There's a lot of that in Kosia, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of this sort of entropy of post-apartheid. Yeah. Highways falling apart, or squatter settlements on the side, and electricity not working, and stuff like that, which I've never really known what to make of. It sounds like this is a, a, kind of a more interesting direction to go in, and like look in the townships or places where they hadn't had it before, and see what kinds of writing is produced out of that experience. Yeah. Um, so I was also a grammar, so I spent a lot of time thinking about actually. You just installed one, is that what you said? Yeah, I was also a grammar. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so I think about stuff like this a lot. Um, but that works by private owners of the panels feeding into the government infrastructure of the grid, which seems like one of the sustainable ways to spread energy across the map. But there needs to be that infrastructure for the private sector to come in. So how do you think we could combine the two in order to 
be both efficient for the planet and get power to everyone as a human right. How do we comply to uh, Well, anyway, that whole idea is a fascinating one, right? Where your solar panel could be contributing to the grid is great. It's like not, then you're just not a, you're not a consumer anymore. You're a producer amongst other producers and consumers, and that's kind of a, a beautiful vision for like what civic participation could be, right? Like if you have a solar panel, you're giving something back. It's, it's, it's awesome. Um, you know, I don't even know what to say. I mean, I don't know how you do that. It seems like it's something that would be easy to promote. But then I've seen in my research, like all the resistance to electricity in Ireland, you know, because they had gas lamps in the city of Dublin in the, in the period that I researched. And so everybody was scared to make them electric. And so what they did was they made a lamp that looked like a gas lamp and they made it electric so that people could get used to it, right? It's called, it's called skeuomorphism in, in, uh, in programmer talk, I guess, right? You make the thing look like something that somebody, everybody's used to. All, all I can say is it's a great idea that it seems like it's going to meet with resistance because people are used to it and people are going to be freaked out by it for any number of reasons. It's going to take time. And maybe some skeuomorphic solution, you know, some way of presenting it to people so they don't feel like it's a complete revolution how they do things is, is might be a solution. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> that was a long-winded way of saying that. But yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to give you one final question, which sure. gives, gets us back into like the realm of literature, which will be nice. Um, and this is, I don't have an answer to this, it's very speculative, and feel free to say no, but have you run across or thought about the relationship between this and like science fiction or post-apocalyptic narratives? Or, because I started reading The Wind-Up Girl, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't finish it. Well, we're on the exact same page, or that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know where it was going, but I thought that there might be some, because it's a post-apocalyptic narrative, and like Thailand is the center of kind of everything in that novel. And I was wondering if that kind of redistribution of power that really can happen in like fantasy sci-fi post-apocalypse um, might be something to think about in relation to the way it's presented in these more kind of realist narratives. The redistribution of power? Or the redistribution of like electricity. Oh, how does it happen in that book? Well, I don't know because I didn't finish it. But I thought <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Because yeah. it seems like everything comes back to Thailand. And if the, the resources uh, centered in Thailand, but in that book, if I remember correctly, it's food resource. Oh, okay. So it's not quite the same, but again, I don't know how that book is going to end. I'm sure it was going to go somewhere interesting. I just didn't finish it. Yeah, um, I've been told it goes somewhere interesting, but it wasn't getting there fast enough for me. I should probably explore more science yeah. fiction. Um, again, I tried that book, Jimmy. I don't know what happened. Just didn't We're on the same page, so you don't have to justify that to me. So, but like, any other like science fiction or apocalypse, like it seems like a narrative that should be exploring this kind of question, but I can't think yeah. of anything that is. Well, generally speaking, like the dystopian fiction, or, the yeah. science fiction, deal with like a zombie story. Right? It's always a story. Of, there's no infrastructure, mm -hmm. and people, you know, the zombie is always always the best zombies are the ones that are wearing the uniform for some weird job. They clearly uh -huh. and without any infrastructure or economy or anything, it just doesn't exist anymore. Like birthday party clown or something, or you, know, or you have overalls because you're like a mechanic or something, but nobody has cars, so it doesn't matter. So then you just run around eating human flesh, because what else would you do? Exactly. <laughs> what, what and you're happen? all stuck in the mall in that yeah, one movie, because yeah. nothing, and there's no power anyway, so. So I guess, I can, that's all I can think of, it's like, yeah. a lot of the science fiction examples, or the fantasy examples, are places without infrastructure, yeah. and then how people cope with that, or build their own, but I can't think of anything specific, or, or science fiction-y about how that, how that would work.